So um, thanks to Dimitri's kind deferral, he let me hijack the last session because I thought it might be nice to talk about an application and go into the details about how ontology is difficult an application. We have all these beautiful services and wonderful uh, tools and uh, crazy languages, and sometimes it's hard to connect it back to what they're actually good for or what they can really successfully do, or maybe more importantly, why. Um, so the major benefit, I think, in general, from the development time perspective, oh, by the way, if you want the slides, then I'll just um, at least at one time, is, is it's supporting this notion of development-oriented, uh, definition-oriented development of terminologies, of mappings, of data integration solutions, and so forth. So that's what I'm going to pitch today. It's not the only possible um, benefit that ontologies can bring, but I think it's probably a major one, and certainly the best developed one, and by activity, the highest. Most people spend their time building ontology. <laughs> and there's a reason why they do that. Okay, so utility. This is what we're, we're focused on here. Because today, you learned a lot about ontologies today, yesterday, fire day. You learned about the languages, the services, the underlying logic, a little bit about computation, and a bit about how to model them. And in the end, you're either dead but happy, or you're Paul. Um, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking at those front teeth, which I particularly dislike. Uh, I don't, I don't know where you get either. those from. Um, so the big question is, what are they good for? What are they good for? Why would you want an ontology? You've been, you've been learning ontology engineering for four days now, but, but why? This is why we need this session, but representations of semantic representation of data. Okay, I agree. Semantic representation of data. But isn't that just another word for ontology? And it's not what the ontology does, right? It's just another paraphrase of the term ontology, a semantic representation of, of data. But why do you want a semantic representation of data? I mean, What's the point of it being semantic? I mean, I have data. I know what I do with data. I do queries. I learn things. I, I control things. Like all sorts of stuff. I know what to do with data. And then you tell me, okay, all that stuff you've been doing with that data, yeah, it needs to be better. It needs to be semantic data. But then what do I gain from semantic data as opposed to unsemantic data? Syntactic data? What's non-semantic? So, so what are they good for? Again, but representing the knowledge of the subject debate doesn't tell me what I do with that knowledge, right? Once I've got the knowledge, how do I exploit it? I mean, if I put knowledge into your head of how to perform a surgical procedure, you can perform a surgical procedure. The representation in your head is, is interesting, but what it's used for is to do something. So what do we do with an ontology? To get new knowledge. Sorry. New knowledge. Could get new knowledge. That's something that might come out of an ontology. Certainly there's, there's two ways. There's implicit knowledge. So we might model something in one way and we learn some links. So new knowledge, new knowledge is good. Okay. What else? I'm sure people claim that there are benefits for ontology too. Well, what's, what's your go-to one? Come on, you must have one, right? What's the, what, why an ontology? What are they good for? Well, uh, I mean, you can access data with them on the new knowledge, but that's it. I'm looking for a phrase here. Ontologies are good for? Ontology. Oh, based data. Yeah, so, so data integration or data enrichment. So that's the common. So data integration, terminology development. So Pavel, I believe, talked during his talk about building ICD-10. So building large um, uh, sets of codes which are then used in data entry in order to provide 
common representations of a condition. So we, instead of me looking at some doctor's handwriting where they said, you know, died of a blow to the head, and the other one said smack with the bat, right? You know, <laughs> they go look up in the terminology, and it's, I would hope, smack with the bat, because I think that's funnier, and they both put in the code. And thus, when we start doing aggregate statistics, we know that we're getting, have a fighting chance of getting all and only the, the right. But data integration as well, we represent, so this is where a semantic representation of data might be helpful, if we have a richer, if we take the database schema and lift it up into an ontology, then we can hope to find connections between the ontologies either automatically or by inspecting the underlying structure. So these are the sort of standard kinds of um, core tasks that people pin out for ontologies. However, that wasn't the big question. So the bigger question, let's presume for the moment that they're at least somewhat fit for purpose. That is, you can, with some help, use them for data integration. You can, with some help, with a working version of Protege, use them for terminology developments. We know people have done this, so we know it can be done. Now the question is, what's the marginal gain? Does everybody understand the concept of marginal Does anybody understand the concept of marginal gain? So, so this is, I'm just gonna, we have, we have here, let's say, this is, this is minus 100, whatever unit you want to say, dollars, rubles, pounds, here's plus. So this is the cost, this is the benefit. If I use a relational database, it costs something, right? For some tasks. But it's supposed to bring me some benefit as well. And I hope that the benefit is larger than the cost. And that's the general, general thing. I, I hope it's quite a bit larger. Surprisingly, one of the things that um, has been very surprising in the history of IT is that often using computers doesn't produce a large gain, particularly on productivity. So you might have thought, ah, oh, I spent all this money on computers, I spent all this money training people, I should get huge productivity gains. No, um, in fact, the productivity tends not to be hugely enhanced by uh, the, the integration of computers. And the, the example that they give that shows this is that is newsletters. So people do newsletters, and they used to do it by typing up some things and then cutting and pasting them and then photocopying them. And this is slow and cumbersome. You can see how it's a pain. If you mistype something, you have to go erase it and retype it in. And with a computer, you just go and edit and reprint. Isn't that great? No, what happens is that when people have a computer, they can do more. And so they do fancy fonts and crazy graphics and all sorts of stuff, and that eats up all the productivity gains. However, at least in that case, if the design is good, you end up with a better product. So even if you don't produce more of the same thing, maybe you get a better product. Okay, so if this is the, the, the relational database. So we move to out for something, right? Let's just say representing the data. Well, again, we have costs. I don't know. <laughs> right? And they come from a lot of different sources. Some of the costs might just be because um, we have less infrastructure. Right? It's, 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 it's not as well developed. And presumably we have benefits. And what we would like, this is the marginal gain. Right? It's the difference in overall gain from using now or an ontology versus using a database, for example. So in general, when we're looking at an alternative technology, we're looking to see what the marginal gain is. Because if there's no marginal gain, you're, you're, you don't get any benefit. And even if there is a marginal gain, it might not be that it's enough to be just a little bit better. Because in fact, switching technologies tends to incur a lot of hidden costs. You have to retrain. You know, even if you, you sort of do a head-to-head -head comparison, um, you run maybe larger risks. Will, will, will there be anybody, um, you know, Oracle's going to be around for another 10 years. Will, will anybody building reasoners be, be working on these reasoners in 10 years? Right, I mean, so usually you want to have a two or three times gain, a marginal gain, before you really feel comfortable switching, particularly in fundamental technology. Switching your web browser is actually pretty expensive for most people. And some people, it's not because they don't use bookmarks, they don't, they don't, they just go and they only click, so they don't use any key commands. But for most of us, switching browsers is actually a fairly big deal, and that's hugely painless compared to switching an information technology. 
So again, what we're trying to understand is the marginal net gain. And this is actually something that's really hard to measure. Really, really hard to measure, even to, to estimate. So I'm going to build a couple models and point to a little bit of empirical data. Um, so I'm going to provide some sort of attempt at, at answering this question, or at least pointing where we should be looking for this benefit. And only in one fairly small area. I think that this kind of analysis is, it, it's, it's just not very well done across computer science. Um, uh, programming language people have started to get a little more serious about this. You know, what's the benefit of using one programming language over the other, if any, particularly on productivity, um, things are important. So just, just again, there's going to be a lot of me saying, and I don't know, again. Um, and just wanted to remind you that, that not knowing that you don't know is, the most, is perhaps the, the most important thing you can do. Uh, so this is Socrates, and uh, he went around asking people what they knew, and they all said stuff, and they seemed to know things like how to, how to build a horseshoe, and then he asked them something else, which clearly they had no clue, and they were just as confident about that. And he said, well, I don't know how to make a horseshoe, but at least I know that I don't know anything about politics. And that's the foundation of wisdom. So I think one of the first things, particularly in a hype latent field like computer science in general, or a hype latent field like subfield, even more hype latent subfield like the semantic web, the first thing that we need to do is to try to figure out what we don't actually know. And, and, and from there, we can start to, to figure out, to learn things, and to, to, to know them. OK, so I said definition-oriented development, so I'm starting with the development time Phenomenon. So we want to build something, perhaps a terminology. We could just build it by hand. We could just start writing terms on index cards and build up a little taxonomy and encode it in XML or RDF or whatever. But we're hoping to do something better than that, that we think that we could at least beat that. We can't beat that, right? If we can't beat people scribbling things on whiteboards, then we're really in trouble, right? But the computer should get us something better, better than that. But for this, we need to understand the development cycle. So we start with a, a domain expert, somebody who has knowledge about medicine, or financial stuff, or physics, or um, of mechanical processes, any, any domain that, like, that we feel that we could represent it now. I generally think about biomedical, because that's where a lot of the stuff is done. So they know stuff, but they don't always know it in a form that they can easily share. <laughs> Being able to understand, for example, an article on cancer fighting drugs and being able to explain that to somebody else are very different things. And it's yet another step to be able to like, build a, a, a form that would, or a checklist that would help you in the application of that cancer drug. So you have to conceptualize your knowledge. You have to take it, what's in your head and somehow, or implicit in your head, and sometimes somehow systematize it, organize it, Make it in some form that you can then verbalize at the very least. We need to get it out of our heads and into the public domain, something shared. Now, up until this point, we could be scribbling on whiteboards and drawing things and writing things and, and, and calling people, and, and that's all good, but we want to do more. We want to mechanize it somehow. And the first step for mechanizing it, for most of us, is to formalize it, to take it from some sort of natural language complex thing and put it into a beautiful logic. Right? <laughs> and so we go from, from just having it in kind of some complex passive way, we try to systematize it in some way, and then gradually produce it into more and more concrete terms and more and more computable forms. So that eventually we would have, be able to have the computer have that knowledge that we had in our head. Now we need to do something with it after that, of course, but, but, but at least this is the idea that we're trying to, to get across, right? And whether it's in a fancy logic or if it's in, in, in some, some weaker form. This, 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 it's, in all cases, when we try to get it to some sort of computable form, this process of translating it from something which typically doesn't have a very well-defined meaning to something which is concrete and computable is, is the process that we need to do, whether it's a relational database, XML, Topic maps, if for those of you who want to go really old school and really, at some point a piece of code is going to have to work with the representation one way or the other. Okay, so, so that was a really simple development style, and it presumed that the, um, that the, the, the domain expert was also the knowledge engineer. So 
So you, so you just go, you walk into a hospital, and you go and you know, wander around freely, you know, wear one of those little robes so nobody kicks you out, and you find a doctor and say, here, um, watch these videos from the summer school that I just had, and write me up some, some owls about you know, heart disease. Yeah, typically, that's not going to happen. The clinician will then call security, and you'll have a very comfortable night in either the loony bin or jail. It's your, your, your pick, right, <laughs> at that point. So we typically mediate the conceptualization. Instead of just verbalizing it and writing it down ourselves, we have a knowledge engineer, somebody who's perhaps not as expert in the domain, but is expert in the formalism. So they have to understand whatever formalism they're using, and not just a, a, a passing familiarity with the semantics and syntax, and they can write, you know, you know, uh, uh, mothers or subclasses of women. They have to understand not just the formalism, but the ecosystem around it. So they have to know what, what you get for representing things certain ways. Um, so typically, they understand the tools. They understand how to run protege without a passion too much. Um, they understand everything as much as around that. And they typically have a little domain knowledge so that at least they can talk with the domain expert. This is all idealized. Typically, you know, these two people overlap, and there's more of them, right? Um, so, and again, we have a formalization process, which then results in, in knowledge. Now, this is a very, you know, from the from the from the source of knowledge, it flows through the pipes and ends up in the computer, and that's one model. And if the computer can't do much with it, right? If once it gets the representation, you know, it just sort of sits there. So. PDF, for example, just sits there. But even perhaps a relational database. So let's say you model all this stuff in a relational database. What happens? Nothing happens, right? And you have to think, think then to do more work, to think up some queries, and then maybe you can get some joy there. At least with a logic, particularly a, a description logic like thing, we have some things that the computer can immediately give us back, right? Because we can classify. We have a set of sort of speak standard queries. Sanity checks, consistencies, path satisfiability, and sort of domain information. This is sort of getting more knowledge out of it. Things that we didn't know from our definitions, implicit assumptions. And so we kind of hope that we get a feedback loop. Just as there should be a feedback loop between the domain expert and the knowledge engineer. So the domain expert says something like, oh, look, well, you know, uh, all cancer uh, uh, manifests tumors. The uh, knowledge engineer says that all cancers. Really? All cancers, every possible cancer will result in a tumor. And that goes back to the process of trying to make it explicit and write it down forces the knowledge, the domain expert to think more clearly about what they're saying, to make the implicit constraints that they have. Oh yeah, all cancers except leukemia, which is a blood cancer, manifest in tumors. I forgot that exception, and I forgot that you didn't know that. Um, usually when we're talking amongst ourselves, we implicitly admit leukemia or we make it explicit and it's all fine. And so that, that activity of going back and forth between different people or in different modalities, I, I'm sure you all have the experience of thinking something and it being so clear and so beautiful, and then going to say it, and all of a sudden it's something really dumb, and then going to write it down, and then, uh, it's just hopeless there, right? The, the shift from different modalities or in different contexts between different people puts pressure on our understanding and our representation and requires us to, 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 to evolve it in a variety of ways. And that's what's happening here. Write something down, it sounds good. Say something, it sounds good. Write it down and out, it sounds good. Give it to the computer and all of a sudden everything's inconsistent. Okay, we got something confused. It provides us some feedback. So in principle, this should be, this could be where we would find a marginal gain, right? A unique benefit, even. If we can get some sort of feedback on our representing, it might save us errors. Um, if the, the computer can elaborate knowledge that we would otherwise have to elaborate, extract more from what we say than what we explicitly say, then that would save us effort. So these are at least two areas where we might hope that using an ontology would produce a gauge. So we can reduce certain kinds of effort. So instead of focusing, for example, we're building a taxonomy of terms, instead of focusing on where they go, right, oh, is, um, is, is the, the, the menococcus, is it a bacterial disease, or is it, is it a, a disease of the central nervous system? Who knows, right? It, 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 
it's both in some sense. Maybe it's you know maybe it's uninteresting to say either of these. But instead of focusing about where it goes and thinking about it navigationally, you can just focus on defining the term. That's a more local kind of knowledge. Local kind of benefits. We get verification benefits, right? When we say something, there's consequences. Other things follow, and those things are visible, or at least we can make them visible to us. So if we say something bonkers, there's, we should get a bonkers result from the reason. This is one reason why it's important to try to make your ontologies as, as rich as possible, to say as much as you can, because the more that you say, the more stuff the researcher can draw out of what you're saying, you can find the wrong things, you can find things which are too strong or too weak. We can spot wrong links if we get a subsumption that's in the wrong place, if it really is in the wrong place. You know, if you say, if, if by inference the, the menococcus ends up as a bacterial disease and the, and the neuroscientist says, wait, 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 it's a central nervous system disease, and we say, oh well, over here it's also found to be a central nervous system disease. He's happy, and they said, you know, it's a tummy ache. Well, okay, we all agree that it being a tummy ache is bonkers. That's just wrong. So we said something wrong in our, we did something wrong in our model. Of course, with wrong links, there's still work on our part to detect these problems. We have to look and inspect the links. We can't just say, oh, there's a bunch of red here, the whole thing's inconsistent, give me a justification. For these, we have to do some sort of work. But inferred links are a subset of all links. We don't have to inspect all links to see the consequences of the results. We can just look at the ones that are found by, by the reasoner. The reasoner can tell us stuff about the broken definition. So detecting problems is one half of the problem. The other half is understanding what went into them. And it's not just that it's nice to have you know, a pointer to the line and oh, we just delete that line and everything's fine. Um, by looking at how these axioms interact with each other and seeing how they affect a broken, a produce a broken entailment, an entailment which is wrong, um, we can come to a better understanding of our own definitions. Oh, the reason that it's going here is that we said that it was a disease of the whole body and the, the tummy is part of the body and oh yeah, okay, I see, we we're just too strong there. We can come to better understand our own model, and both from our mistakes and from our successes. It also can improve interaction. So instead of producing something and then, okay, what do I do with it? Okay, I've got this list. I can, I can go up the list. I can go down the hierarchy. I can go up the hierarchy. I can try to think of a query. We get pushback. Um, and pushback is important because I mean, I'm sure if you, uh, I mean, when I proofread, you know, I write, I can't proofread my own stuff to save my life because I just keep reading it as, if, as I think it, not as I wrote it. Um, one common trick for proofreaders is that they start at the back and read backwards because by reading backwards, you don't, do, you don't engage all the same error correction mechanisms that we all have. Our, our linguistic system is, is tuned for error correction, right? <laughs> it's, it's really, really, we can, we can interpret incredibly noisy input. But that means it's very hard for us to catch the noise in the input because we're, we're designed to skip over it in a variety of ways to interpolate stuff. So if you just read over, if you just look at what you wrote and nothing's happening, then you're in that mode of just reading what you wrote. If somebody reads it, essentially reads it a while back to you or says, oh, so you said that the menococcus is a disease of the, is a tummy ache, it's a kind of tummy ache, that shifts your modality in a way. It's just the way that you're looking at things. It makes it perhaps more likely for you to um, see what's going on. And of course, all these come at some computational cost. We immediately have a higher cost for this because reasoning is expensive. The process of going through reasoning can be very expensive. It's often quite tricky to predict it. So we can't plan our days nicely around a compiled edit link cycle um, because we don't know whether the classification is going to take a few seconds or a couple of days, right? You know, I mean, so, so there are these psychological costs. Now, one real problem is measuring any of these. Particularly, I think, interact the, the effects of interaction. This is a very subtle one. And um, it's very sensitive to the experience of the people involved. Similarly, it's not clear up here exactly what the benefits are. So if it's hard to write a definition, it takes a lot of work to write a definition. So much work that you end up essentially putting it in the right place and then sort of writing, just writing a definition to kind of fit it afterwards, it might actually be counterproductive. But these are at least the places we should be looking for benefit. 
in particular differential hypothetical. Okay, so since those things are hard, one thing we might do is try to build a simpler case and see whether we can figure out these, the values for those benefits um, in that case. So we're going to do a little, little case study. So the target, the thing we're trying to build is, is what I've been talking about before, a hierarchical controlled vocabulary, so a taxonomy. So a, a list of terms arranged in subsumption relations. This is the output. These would be used for data entry, for data retrieval, for all sorts of things that controlled vocabularies are used for throughout. It might be in a library, it might be for search expansion. Those are all the different applications we might, might use them for. Okay. So without logically encoded definitions, so without definition-oriented development, we're left with term-oriented development. We just have a list of terms and we work with them in one way or another and we try to arrange them directly into a hierarchy. So what do we do? What's the process? Well, we formulate, we still have to formulate the definitions, right? We have to know what the terms mean. And we could skip that step, I guess, but we still need to understand what term, at least which terms are the same. The typical thing that they, in library science they do when they build a controlled vocabulary is they, is they like look in search logs or something like that, or in, in titles, and they build a long list of terms, and they go through, these are the same, these are the same, these are the same, these are the same, these are different, these are the same, this one. They go through, and they do, at least implicitly, have a conceptualization of the definitions. We then need to put the terms in their proper place. We have to build the hierarchy. So we have the terms, we have some idea of what they mean, and we put them in a hierarchy. In order to put them in the proper place, we have to assert every non-trivial link. So I mean, you know, if we have, we don't need to assert the transitive closure of the, of the hierarchy, we just need to assert it once. But each one of these, if there's a link, if there's a path between, two terms in our controlled vocabulary, some person had to sit down and think, oh, these two terms belong together. And we need to, to get them at the right place. So, you know, this would have been a mistake because C really belongs below B. So this is the kind of effort we need to put forward. We need to check that the right links, that the links that we have are true and that they're somehow as low down as they can go. So that we attach it all and only the true subsumptions in the terminology. So, in normal definition, in normal term-oriented development, all these steps are mediated by people. They're done explicitly by hand. Um, and, the, of course, the hint here is that, is that we hope that we can get rid of all this stuff, or at least make this stuff a lot easier by, by mechanizing the results of this step. We can mechanize the results of this step we hope that the, the, the effort we need to do in the rest of it is substantively reduced, or at least the correctness is improved. I, I'd accept either of these or some combination of them. Um, okay, so how much work is this in a typical scenario? I mean, what are we talking about? Are we just talking about A, B, and C? Well, we're done, let's go home already. We don't need an ontology at this point. Maybe even a couple hundred terms. I mean, it doesn't sound that bad. Well, Obviously, we have 100 terms. We have a principle of a quadratic number of possible subsumptions. So that's an overstatement of, the, of, of what actually could happen because really, you know, we don't need to be naive about it. I mean, it's not like we're going to sit there and say, okay, here's these two terms. Yeah, one subclass to the other. Okay, here's these two terms. I mean, we're going to be smart. We're going to build a hierarchy, try to put things in the right place. But still, in principle, this is what we're, we're coping with. We have to to deal with some fraction of a fairly large space of possible connections. But how many terms, so then the question is, since this is the upper bound, how many terms do we need in practice? Because current terminologies tend towards hundreds of thousands, or even millions of terms. So even if you're not getting a quadratic law, we only need a small factor for this to be quite infeasible, difficult, um, unpleasant. Okay, so, um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk a real case. This is ICD-9 to ICD-10 and to ICD-11. So the international classification of diseases, the mortality, mortality and morbidity um, uh, codes that are used all over the world to, 
to gather statistics. If, if, if you hear that, if you read an article which says that, that heart disease is on the rise, it's because people have coded it against I, ICD and reported it and, and aggregated it. Okay, so historically we have a trend here. In 1972, there were uh, eight codes for bicycle injury. You know, you fell off, um, <laughs> you hit someone, um, uh, you, you, kind of, you, 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 you got tangled up in the chain, a few other things, eight codes. Um, a successor one had 81. The successor to that grew slightly less so, so 87. And then ICD-10 has 587 codes for bicycle injury. And if you look at all the ICD codes, you start to see two things. Once you start to see crazy things, and the other side you start to see patterns. So some of the crazy things. Occupant of three-wheel motor vehicle, injured in collision with pedal cycle, there's the bicycle, person on outside of the vehicle, non-traffic accident while working for income. Now this is my personal favorite, which doesn't involve a bicycle. Drowning in submersion while in bathtub, street and highway, engaged in a sports activity. So all I can think is that in like Australia, they must have drag bath races, right? You know, where they get a car and they tie a bathtub in the back and you have to wash yourself while they drive down the road and then people slip in the bathtub and drown while they're riding down the road. Victim of volcanic eruption, street and highway while resting, sleeping, eating, or engaging in other vital activities. So, you know, Pompeii erupts again. You know, your family says, oh, let's get into the car, let's get into the car. I say, no, no. While we're out on this road, I'm going to take a nap first, and the lava comes down and and and, and the road. So the thing to, re to to realize is that it's getting much worse. So ICD-10, one code for suturing an artery will become 195 codes. Suturing an artery while well, in a bathtub playing tennis. I don't know. I mean, you know. Um, a single code for a badly ill fracture will now translate to 2,500 terms. Now, what's happening in ICD-10? In ICD-10, instead of just saying fracture, they have the ability to say a fracture of your femur on the left side. Boom! All of a sudden, I need a term for the fracture of the femur on the left side, a fracture of the femur on the right side, a fracture of the kneecap on the left side, a fracture of the kneecap on the right side, and then. And why? Because people want to know about this stuff. This stuff is helpful for us. It, it, you know, it would be useful. You, you can imagine a research project which tried to figure out whether you know, people who are right-handed are more likely to break their right leg. Right? Is there a correlation between that? Are people left-handed more likely to break either of their legs? Um, people doing medical research have a desire and a need for an almost infinite level of detail when, when looking at these things. And the ICD is trying to supply that detail. And of course, this is just deadly, right? I mean, this is just, you cannot fruitfully keep doing this and, and hope for it to, to work out. So it's a compositional problem. We're using opaque names, even though the names implicitly have such structure. Badly healed fracture of the left femur, right? And badly healed fracture of the right femur, most of the two things are the same. So sh we should be able to somehow use less than one big long string, but the names are opaque. From the computational point of view and from the, the building representation, they're just A and B as far as we're concerned, G37 and G41. Since we're using opaque names, every combination needs a new name, and then we're, we're off and running and screwed. So when building these things, we have to trade off precision for the number of terms. And in ICD-10, they decided to go nuts on the, on the number of terms. So we have two problems. The first problem is that we have a lot of terms. I mean, a lot of terms. How do we manage all of these terms? And we have a pressure to keep adding more terms. So some, some of these pressures are fundamental, right? They're just an, a, a, a fact about the domain that we're dealing with. And that's the fact that medical knowledge expands. So this is the Edwin Smith papyrus, it's the earliest known surgical text. And this is a typical day for a med student in their backpack. Um, and medical record keeping needs expands. 
We want to know more things about what we're doing for cost purposes, for efficacy purposes, for checking to see whether things are going well or going poorly in our practices. And then we have the artificial or technical ones, which are basically this combinatorial problem. So given that we already have a pretty severe fundamental problem, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let this get in our way. This, this is something we could solve. We can't solve this one in some sense. But this one we can solve. OK, so here's a little micro case. Can we take those 500 codes with things like pedal cyclist injury collision with two or three wheel motor vehicle, unspe unspecified pedal cyclist, non-traffic accident? I, I assume this means that the, that the car was parked and that they ran into the car, so they, they, they both weren't moving. While resting, sleeping, eating, or engaging in other vital activities. Well, I kind of hope they weren't sleeping while work or, or, or even eating. So we can take this and break it into its pieces, right? It has clear pieces that we're going to reuse all over the place. And in fact, when we look at it, we see that there's 10 things that you could hit. You know, a pedestrian, a cycle, a motorbike, a car, a train, a tree, or something else. So all the codes involve hitting one of these things. And so do other codes, so the, the, the motor vehicle codes all involve hitting this basically the same thing. There's five rules for the person injured. So you can be driving, the passenger, the cyclist, you could be getting in, so not actually in the car. There's 500 activities that happen, resting, being at work, sporting, leisure, other. Notice that in these codes, they tend to get all shoved in here. The codes, in order to reduce the number of um, codes that they're dealing with, tend to be clumpy. They put things, we should be able to distinguish between resting, sleeping, eating, or engaging, seeing other activities. All we can distinguish between is working and not working, which is basically what these two are. So we've lost precision, even though we've opened up the number of, of terms. And we have two contexts, basically in traffic and not in traffic. And we put all this together, we get the 500 codes back out at a price of only 22 terms. So if we could have those 22 turns, now we can see, so this is exactly the, the blow up I was talking about. Instead of having to write 500 standalone terms that have no fixed relation, no inherent relation to each other, they're just okay. We know them, but we have to, and look at them, look at them. They're evil. <laughs> they're really hard to understand. I don't know if I would be able to easily distinct, to, to even tell whether I typed pedal cyclist injury collision with two or three wheel motor vehicle, unspecified pedal cyclist, and had specified as pedal cyclist. I mean, the difference between those two is like invisible to me. So verifying this, I end up doing a lot of work that is just wasted and pointless and, and not what we're good at. Whereas here, are these all, are these all the things to hit? that we want. What about squirrels? I really want to know about the, the mortality of squirrels due to bicycles running over them, right? That's something, I'm, I'm a squirrel study person, and I want to know about squirrels. Well, I can make a case to add squirrels. Instead of adding another 500 for all the squirrel versions of that, I can say, let's just add squirrel. That's something to So the other problem here <coughs> is that what we're trying to do when we build these opaque terms is we're trying to anticipate <clears throat> every possible description that people are trying or would want to build. And we just don't know, right? We just don't know what everybody is going to be doing. As it's clear here, they didn't get it right the first 15 times, and so they're, 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 getting, they're going on. Um, so, uh, so this is a wonderful quote from uh, Alan Rector. Um, so the, the thing that he identifies as what's holding back reuse of these knowledge structures, of these terminologies that people do, is that they force application-specific choices. So you put together your terms in specific ways that you know now that you want them to go together. So you know that you want bicycles and, um, and, and, and two or three wheel vehicles to go together. But you never thought about bicycles and ice skaters because, damn it, in the winter in Australia, the, the, the bathtubs freeze over, and so you know what they do in the drag races is they ice skate on that. And, and, and sometimes bicycles hit the ice skaters, right? So you never thought of this because you're not Australian and you're a sane person, but the Australians are not sane, and this is a significant fraction of the people who break their legs or die on the highway, and they want to represent that. 
And you can't possibly can't, can't anticipate that. And so the, for him, the key application-specific decision is the organization of this fixed taxonomy. You pick your terms, you pick the level of detail that you want, you arrange them in a hierarchy, and that's it. And this just doesn't serve, as we saw in my first talk, hierarchies aren't neutral. People, and it's not just non-neutral as in between GM and, and Echo Washer Inc., right? It's not neutral for the intellectual purpose that we might have for them. Somebody who's studying um, highway safety, right, is going to have a different view on what terms are important and, and how they should be arranged than somebody who's concerned on trauma care. Right? The trauma care person doesn't care necessarily about how it happened or what vehicle hit what or what. They care about the brake, the structure of the brake, how it came together, whether it's poking through the skin, how long it's been since the person did it. Whereas the, the person who's trying to design a better highway, maybe better traffic signals, cares a lot about whether the bike hit the car or the car hit the bike. Right? And they might not even care about whether what kind of injury it was. They might only care about whether the person died had a hospitalizable injury or walked away. The key takeaway is that any fixed organization of such complex ideas is fundamentally arbitrary. So if we're going to make reusable representations, we need to avoid such decisions. We need to provide the tools for building such choices, but not to build too many of them in. Okay, so here's a simple, a very trivial coordination example. So imagine a very simple taxonomy, the simplest taxonomy, almost the simplest taxonomy you can imagine. We want to talk about allergies. We know that there's specific kinds of allergies to milk or to nuts, and we even know something about nuts. Right? We know that there are pecans and hazelnuts, walnuts, and almonds. And so this is the kind of thing that goes, so, so there will be codes associated with this. This can be N37, this is N1, N2, N3, N4. There's something like that. And when we go to our, our, our you know, clinical health record, we type that in, it gives us a drop-down list that tells us which one we can fill. This is fine. Okay, no problem. For our nut allergy, so we'll just look at this, just look at this term for the moment. This is the only term that's a medical term at the moment. Right? In our taxonomy, we only have, the only allergy we have is the nonspecific allergy and the nut allergy. The nut allergy is fairly nonspecific, right? You're looking at that and say, okay, well, you know, we don't know that you have a pecan allergy versus a hazelnut allergy. All we know is that you have a nut allergy, which is better than knowing just that you have an allergy because, okay, are we going to, is the hospital going to bring up a peanut butter sandwich or not, right? You know, I mean, this is an important thing that we would need to know. But now you can see, this drives us, if, if we have only opaque terms, this exactly drives us to saying, okay, under nut allergy, let's put pecan allergy, hazelnut allergy, walnut allergy, and almond allergy. Right? It immediately makes us do the cross product, because we want to be specific. This is how we want to be specific. And if we, if we only have names, the only way we can do it is by adding a bunch more names. Now, if we were to have a form using this, the problem would come up. We have, you know, so this is, these are the only codes. This is what we have. We can say allergy, nut allergy, other. <laughs> okay, so what do you do as a clinician when you have a patient who has an almond allergy? Do you select allergy and then put almond <laughs> in the text box as a hint? Do you say nut allergy and add again specifically almond? Or do you say other because it's none of the terms that you actually use and you want the people to notice that it's not a term that you actually use? And then put almond, almond i.e. nut allergy in there. So notice that we've now gone from a development time problem to a deployment time problem or runtime problem. By making choices up front, not only do we mean that we have to do a lot more work, but we have to anticipate that people are going to be faced with this circumstance. This might have seemed perfectly reasonable to us when we were building the, the terminology ourselves, but if we think about what is the clinician supposed to do here? Which one they're supposed to use? And I guarantee it, given clinicians, they'll do all three of those ways and about 15 more, right? <laughs> 
this will this 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 essentially destroys the value of our terminology because we don't end up with consistently coded records. We don't even end up with consistently coded records for nut allergy because people will put in other because it's not just a nut allergy, it's something else, it's the almond allergy. So even if you include this text form, you won't get you'll, you'll get things that are, are, are not particularly helpful. So all these choices have problems. We have the fact of divergent choice. So people make different choices. The uncontrolled bits are problematic. So even when people, even if people were consistently saying nut allergy, right? So we got everybody to say nut allergy. And so nut allergy, say nut allergy. Never use other. Don't use other. We hate other. Still, some people are going to write almond allergy. Some people will write almond. Some will be, hey, this is really an, an almond allergy. And all of a sudden, we have to figure out out of all the, and some people will put nothing at all. Oh, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention to this bit. If you didn't give me what I needed. And so again, our, our data becomes incredibly messy. So here's the question. We've got all this. We have a problem set up. Can definition solve? We saw they could help us at runtime, I mean at development time. So potentially we could have compiled the nut allergies by just adding some queries and saying, you know, enumerate all the nut allergies, coin a new that, 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 that could help us. But can they help at runtime as well? Well, Obviously, the definition that we're going to want for nut allergy is an allergy that's caused by some nut. It's a very simple way of linking these two out, these two hierarchies. Notice that we didn't have that. And if we didn't have the, the, the we, we didn't have the definition, we delete the definition again. There's no connection between these two terms, any of these terms, except the lexical one, which is obviously highly underlined. Nut is not a kind of nut allergy, so we can't just shove it underneath which is something people do. Because you want to help somehow make them, they destroy part of the semantic properties of their hierarchy in order to make it make sense from a cognitive point of view. I'm looking for nuts, so, so that it should be under nut allergy, the kind of nut. But now we've established a link between them, an implicit link, but a connection between the two. And that has nice consequences, because we have the expressive power, for example, to write Allergy that is caused by some almond. It's a nut allergy. <laughs> it's a kind of nut allergy. We don't have to write out almond allergy or almond allergy subclass of nut allergy. If we add new nuts or kinds of almonds, we don't have to do that. It all falls out of the expressions. The expressions remain there. And we have, if we fix the mode of death, an exponential number of expressions. So we've covered the space of terms by moving from individual opaque terms to phrases. The ability to write a phrase that is as good as a term. And in particular, it will get organized the way the term would get organized. This one will end up as a subclass of nut allergy. So if we're doing a query, if we get our statistics together and we want to query for nut allergies, we will get all the almond allergies. Where if people are just writing almond allergy, until somebody makes the connection, they wouldn't be able to do it. And same with pecan allergy and walnut allergy and the other ones that we have. So we can distinguish two forms of term coordination. And this has to happen for all, all terms. The, the, the first one is called pre-coordination. This is that we don't have a code in our controlled vocabulary without prior agreement. Somebody has to write down, they have to include the code, they put it in the right place. That's the only way it ends up being a code. You might have an other. Other is the big savior of pre-coordinated terms. And ICD is littered with others and when to use other, and how to use other, and whether to use other not specified or other not known. Uh, it's just, it, it, it itself is a significant challenge. This is like having nulls in your database. Once you hit this point, you know you're in trouble. Integrating the others is a post facto process. So what happens? Every five years, ICD-10 goes out, they gather what people have actually used and proposed in extensions, and then they say, oh, yes, Lots of almond allergies out there. Maybe we should add a code for that so that people can enter it. And then they spend three or four or five years deciding what the code should be and where to put it and whether, whether they should add all the subspecies of it or not. And then they publish a new one, by which time a billion more codes have emerged from the bottom of kind of a potential codes. You end up with code drift. 
So new codes can complicate old codes because the meaning shifts or understanding shifts or you try to split something that you didn't split before. Or people have been using codes to mean different things that you intended them to mean because they couldn't mean what they wanted them to mean. Um, actually, the biggest distorter of codes in the US, bill. Insurance companies use a superset of ICD in order to determine how much they pay and whether they pay for a treatment. And if you know the codes and the billing system well, you can make choices <laughs> about your diagnosis and treatment that, that get you a bigger bill. And in fact, it's sometimes a difference between having, getting paid at all. So for Medicare, which is the single biggest payer of, of, for, 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 for healthcare services, um, they have a category that if you don't rise up, you don't get a payment. So every doctor, when they're, when they're writing down this thing, their thoughts are, are strongly dominated, or strongly influenced, at least not dominated, I would say, strongly influenced by how it fits into the coding. And it's not just greed. Um, I, I had some, when I was in the States, I had medical treatment, and my doctor thought about, for a while, which diagnosis to put down, because if she had done one, my insurance would cover it, and if she did the other, my insurance wouldn't cover it, and I would have to pay for it out of pocket. She was getting paid either way, but you know, it made a big difference. And in some sense, it wasn't. I mean, she didn't. She didn't say, "Oh, um, he has the sniffles versus cancer," right? You know, it was within the same general area. But she did something that was less precise or less accurate in order to maximize some other benefit. Even with pre-coordination. Having definitions, having development time definitions can help. So ICD is a lot easier to develop when they're not writing all these codes by hand. Right? When, they, when they only use the, the 22 pieces to assemble the 500, they're in good shape, even though they are sort of compiling into this giant terminology. Working with 22 things is a whole lot easier than working with 500, and so they're still better off with development. Post-coordination, you start with a core set of terms, which is what you publish. So maybe a fixed set, maybe an extensible set. You might allow people to add new core terms. And then a code is any valid expression. So as long as you can build an valid expression from it, it's a code. So this is an exchange. You might actually, in, in, in practical terms when they do this, they put some extra constraints on how, codes, how terms can be composed to be to be sensible, but, but by and large, you allow expressions instead of fixed names. Oops. Um, there will be many nonsensical codes if you're not careful, because somebody will say allergy caused by um, dinner, right? <laughs> or um, it, 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 you know, in a lot of these medical things, they have they have things that you wouldn't imagine. So the NCI thesaurus when I was first examining it, I found um, char grilling. So the national, the NCI is the uh, US National Cancer Institute's research terminology. And so it's all about cancer and DNA and how these things go together. And I was looking through it and it had char grilled catfish. And I, at first I thought it was an Easter egg, you know, something that they slipped in when they were bored. But then I found Hasidic Jew and other belief systems. And then I realized, what it was is that they were these were risk factors for cancer, right? So if you if you eat, eat char grilled things, they, they, somebody did a, somebody somewhere did a study to see whether that was a risk for cancer. Hasidic Jews have women have higher risk for breast cancer, so they had to put everything that could possibly. So there was no boundary <laughs> to what could go into this. Now, if I say that, so so we have to be careful when when we put these things together. And of course, the big dangerous thing is that it requires some reasoning at runtime, at least if you're going to classify the code. So if, I'm, if I put it, if I write my code almond allergy, right, or allergy caused by almonds, then in order for it to get recognized as a nut allergy, which is maybe the only official term I have, the classification has to happen. And classification is expensive. This is one reason why we have more tractable profiles to, to, to answer these things. So the pre-coordination cycle is very much like what we did before. You have the knowledge engineering phase, and there's lots of back and forth here, development time, awesome. And then, boom, you just give it, and they're stuck. What you gave them is what they got. In a post-coordination kind of cycle, 
these folks are writing expressions that then get fed back in. And of course, they will eventually get back here, but this action can be happening all by itself. So, so the development and extension of the terms can happen in a decentralized way. Now, this system has never been realized, this kind of system has never been realized on a large scale. The closest we came was the um, uh, NHS's in England Connecting for Health project. It was a sub-project to do exactly this. Unfortunately, Connecting for Health crashed and burned, not due to ontologies. Ontologies are not to blame for it crashing and burning. Um, uh, any medical system, well, they were recalling all, just getting them, to, so in the NHS, if you make an appointment, you have to get a, a letter in the mail like a week after you, you ask for the appointment and it tells you what it is. And they say, if this isn't good for you, um, call us. And then we'll send you another letter. There's no electronic communication. Um, hospitals can't email doctors. So your GP and your hospital, they communicate by, by, by mail, by, by physical snail mail. Um, so they have really deep IT problems. Uh, I'm currently leading a project in coordination with Siemens Healthcare to use something like this in the field. So hopefully, Next year, we will have a post-coordinated system going out to, to hospitals in the US. OK, how will we use this at one time? There's still a whole bunch of challenges. UI issues immediately emerge. Do we really want people to have to write Manchester, doctors to have to write Manchester syntax in, in boxes like that? Paul says, yes, because he, he hates doctors. That, <laughs> that's right. Well, well that, that doesn't seem like it's going to be a huge win. Um, maybe we have part of a form that could maybe do it. Maybe it's just a whole form. All the pieces that you could have together would just be there, right? So we say nut allergy, and then that tells us, hey, we could use an almond. Is it specifically an almond? This would be one way of potentially doing it. In fact, this is basically how we're doing it in, in the, in, with, with scenes. OK, so runtime versus development time. We see benefits at each stage. Right? So we saw benefits for the development process. We can deal with fewer terms. It takes us less time. Um, we have to verify fewer things. We're, we're less time wasted worrying about writing really, really long codes or putting things in the right place, and more about just thinking about what we want to say and how we want to say it. At runtime, we saw that we, we could have people write down what they meant, um, and we didn't have to worry about making sure that we've gotten all the possible codes that were. We could let people generate the appropriate code at the appropriate time. However, each stage has very different requirements. So for example, runtime has really high performance demands. If you're having a hospital medical system, you know, it's, it's a highly multi-user, high transaction environment. So you, know, you can't stop and say, oh, OK, so that plus so is going on. You know, it sends an email to Dimitri, and Dimitri sits down and thinks, oh, I'll just draw a little tableau here. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's a, it's a nut allergy, right? I mean, it has to be, be close to, to real-time performance for this, for this to work. Um, I'm, I'm unfairly maligning Dimitri here. Is it really unfair to malign Dimitri? I don't think so. Uh, it's perfectly all right. But Fat uh, Plus actually is a part of the system, and its performance has held up pretty, pretty well. Um, development time has higher correctness demands. If we're, if we're spending this time to build this vocabulary, we, we want to put more effort into getting it right. But of course, we don't just want to get it right in the logic part. We want to get it right from the modeling reality point of view. So the more time we spend putting together terms that otherwise could be put together for us is time that we're not spending thinking about what we're trying to represent. We can, once we have these, we can go beyond codes. So I gave a little hint about it before. We have these definitions. The definitions tell us something about the structure of the concept. Right? It tells us that cancer has a location, for example. And we can use that definition structure to structure form. So here's a, a simple example. This is a faked version of, of what we hope to be a real, a real system quite soon. So you say that the, you, know, you have a form, a point in your form, and it says disease. What's the disease? And you say cancer. You ask for a location, because you know cancers have location. You give a list of locations that are prominent locations for the cancer to be listed. You select breast. And the form changes. It changes because you have a new concept in play, right? Instead of just talking about cancer, you're talking about a cancer that's located in the breast. That's the concept. We know some stuff about cancers located in the breast. We know, for example, that they have stages. We know, in fact, that they're called breast cancer. So we can even change that code to a more specific code that we have explicitly there. We know that breast cancer has certain stages. This is all represented in the definitions. We select a particular stage, and we know that it has particular sub-stages. So 
instead of having to design an uber form that covers everything, we design the core of the form or pieces of the form and make the rest of the form reactive to the concept, the class expression, that represents our current situation. And by doing that, that gives us information about what else we can include. And so the whole form becomes essentially one giant code and one giant class expression with a form UI laid on top of it. So all this was a bit of a, you know, lots of simplifying and missing parts in, 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 in these models. But I, I hope to at least give you a, a flavor for the kinds of things you should be looking at when you're trying to assess marginal gain or benefit of what's going on. Um, there were both costs, reasoning, learning, retooling. Um, the benefits were clearly, we hope, way more than, than just a little bit here. I mean, it, I think the, the ICD example is a, a development time. Dealing with a small set of, of core terms rather than dealing with all these elaborated ones is just tremendously useful. Um, whether we save effort overall really depends at least in part on the effort for writing definitions. If it takes you two years to write a single definition, then, then, then the fact that you only have to do 22 is, is, is not particularly helpful. The empirical work on this is pretty weak at the moment. The best that I know of is from Jeremy Rogers' um, 2004 thesis, which is a really nice thing. It was coming out of the Galen project, which was a project to build a form like a clinical form system like I was describing before. Um, uh, and there's lots of issues with that. There's lots of more empirical work that really needs to be done, in particular in other domains. But one of the things that he noted, this is actually somebody else, the true comparative cost of manual versus computed crafting and creating classifications is not known. So we don't really know whether the 500 is better than the 22. I mean, we can see, but, but 522 is a little subset of what we have to do. So um, here, they, 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 they did the manual addition of 20 new rubrics to a 2,000-term um, chapter of a, this is a diagnostic um, uh, handbook. So they sat down and they said, OK, have this 2,000 terms, we need to add 20 more. Six full day meetings involving 10 specialists for a total of five person months of effort to add 20 terms. That's, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> they replicated this, so they, they, they did a semantic based computed approach. Here's the goodness of semantics, right? And so they broke the time to do this into two parts. First, they had the boot up cost. They had to, they had to port the 2,000 terms to, to an ontology, and that took two and a half months. And then the time they had the 20 was negligible. Didn't even show up. So the marginal cost was negligible. The cost for adding these additional things were, were, was zero. And the total cost for even moving to the whole new system was half adding 20 terms. So that's a game worth having. Right? That is a game worth having. So if we can identify, if when we're evaluating whether to pick one technology or we can get this kind of, of benefit, then it's just, it's just undeniably worth it. In a lot of other cases, the benefits are harder to see because you have to factor in things like acceptance, infrastructure, um, there are a lot of really great UIs I mean, that in labs are proven to be faster or more efficient, less error prone, but people won't use them because they're either too hard to learn or too unfamiliar, or they only use them occasionally and they have to relearn it each time. So even when we get this kind of thing, it's not 100%. You have to look at the whole, whole system that you're dealing with to determine whether it's worthwhile. But this is a great start. It's going to have to be pretty crappy before <laughs> this is going to be overwhelmed, right? Really quite crap. We need more models and data. So I've been building these small models of the, of, of the process and trying to, to, to assign some weights and figure out when we could get some benefit. Um, uh, I accordingly invite you all to provide some, um, <laughs> and I'm happy to help. Uh, I think this is a really uh, exciting area, and not just in ontology, I think for all information systems. Um, we have a lot of like rival data models, linked data, relational databases, XML databases. And our understanding of, of the trade-offs between them, because they're so different, is really, really, really low. And I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. I think that's a really exciting thing. And that's all.